Tazil diet is stuff that doesn't contain a, a huge long list of ingredients, all right? Because these things have unknown effects on you. Stay away from stay away from um, too much vegetable oil stuff. Vegetable oils can affect your whole endothelial function. But essentially, yeah, you can eat anything, anything that's an animal, anything that's a fish, almost all vegetables, just the carbohydrates like pasta, bread, rice, blah, 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 just run them like down. Anything with flour or anything processed, just bring it down. Bring it down, yeah. Mm. And you will know that it's doing it and stay away from beer, unfortunately. Oh dear. That's one thing I can't do. Um, so <laughs> We're Scottish, right? Or whiskey. Oh, so, uh, and, and um, the, sugar, no, obviously, no. sugar. I, I, don't, well, I doubt I need to sugar, ask you about that. Yeah. I mean, mm. it's, not, it's not like deadly poison, but mm. you've got to be careful that you yeah. don't overload on these things. But if you are, head up to the gym, do some high intense exercise and burn it off. Yeah. Malcolm Kendrick, this is really such an honour to be talking with you right now. Um, and I have to say, preparing for this interview was really, really fun for me because um, watching your talks, listening to your podcasts, uh, you got, you know, you got great information. Um, you really are putting out some really powerful, um, really powerful messages out there to the public. But also, you do it with so much wit and, you know, with, uh, with fun. And so, you know, binging on your um, binging on your talks has been really fun for me. So this is a really good opportunity for me to talk to someone who knows what he's talking about, but then to also just have an enjoyable conversation. Well, thank you. It's nice to be on. Where are you at the moment? So I'm in the Cayman Islands. Um, very nice. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you? Uh, I'm in Macclesfield, which is just south of Manchester. The weather's very nice today, actually. I've yeah. I, uh, been outside doing various things, so I'm feeling oh, a bit... Nice. A bit weather beaten. Yeah, I can see the sun coming in. So oh, yeah, yeah, it looks well, like it's, it's not, a nice it's day. Not, it's not. Uh, it's not that common here. <laughs> Um, but Malcolm, so obviously, I mean, the reason why I wanted to chat to you so badly was because, um, you know, you are a leader when it comes to heart disease and when it comes to um, putting the end to some fallacies out there that are kind of dominating the world. And you are basically at the forefront trying to um, fight against, you know, all of those false messages that are put out there about cholesterol um, and about heart disease and the causes of heart disease. So that's why this is such an important podcast. And I just think that anybody listening really needs to hear what you have to say, because, um, you know, there's just so much to know about this topic. So um, before we get going, I just wanted to ask you a couple of fun questions, really, um, that I was personally wondering. So you have um, a, a number of books about heart disease, about blood, uh, you know, blood clots and, um, you know, statins and so on. But your recent book, The Clot Thickens. Now, I have to say the title of that is absolutely stellar. <laughs> <laughs> like it's it's a fabulous title and also the rest of your books also have great titles so you have doctoring data and you have um you know the great cholesterol con which was an absolute you know juggernaut so who comes up with your book titles because the clot thickens that's pretty that's pretty stellar uh well I'd like to say it was me actually we, we had a little um for all the books um actually the first one was decided by the publisher but for after that the um my we have a little family conflab and I just say what the book's about and we have a little talk and actually it's actually my son that came up with doctoring data and the clock thickens so uh, wow. I have I have I have actually you know said to him uh, well done he wants the royalties and I've told him to get stuffed uh, but uh no no well we talk about it and and it just they just seem to fit so it's good yeah, yeah. He's, he's very good with his words then in this case is they're fab they're really really yeah. fab and um my next question is are you still removed from wikipedia uh as far as i know yeah i'm actually on um rational wiki i don't know if you've ever heard of it no i no. haven't no uh it's kind of set up by i don't know exactly who they are well I, some people have told me who they are but i don't know who they are uh, who kind of do a, a takedown of people they don't like. Um, mm. 
it tends to be there's a very strong um, vegetarian vegan grouping in uh, in Wikipedia, and they tend to get together and strike out at people who they don't like, especially anyone who says if you eat animals, it's perfectly healthy or you know as healthy as you like, and they don't like this message, so they try and attack anyone who dares to suggest this. Because when I was taken down, there were three or four other sort of fairly loud. Uh, you know, the, the vegetarian, vegan dietary stuff or carbohydrates are not particularly healthy mm. or specifically healthy. So anyone who comes out with this message tends to get taken down. There's very little you can do about it. I, I'm not really bothered, but I didn't even know I was on Wikipedia until the moment I was bit taken off it. Anyway. Um, I actually checked the other day and I can confirm you're still off Wikipedia. I am still. <laughs> <laughs> no. So... Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Um, okay, so let, let's dive into it. So um, as, as I said, you've done a number of books on heart disease and the truth behind what the causes are. And your first book, The Great Cholesterol Con, um, was an absolute bestseller. So I guess what I wanted to know is, you know, you're a GP and, you know, it was your first book. So what, what was happening at that time? when you decided, oh my gosh, I need to write a book about this cholesterol con that's happening. Um, what was happening at that time? What made you do it? And you know, what's the story behind all of this? Well, I'd always known it was nonsense. Um, well, I said it always known. When I was at medical school, I was taught by everybody else, you know, if you eat too much fat, saturated fat, it raises your blood cholesterol, which is deposited in the arteries, leading to thickenings called atherosclerosis and eventually these become so thick that you die that was that was it that was the message uh, I had no reason to doubt it at the time you know if you're going to pass an exam cholesterol heart disease um and then uh, but I live in Scotland uh born and bred and at the time I was at medical school which is 90 early 1980 uh, Scotland had the highest rate of heart disease in the world um specifically the west side of Scotland although I didn't actually live there um, and uh, the, the message was all oh, the terrible Scots diet, mill eat deep fried Mars bars and stuff like this, which is all complete nonsense, of course. But I, I was aware, because I went to France quite a lot for various reasons, holidays, skiing, blah, blah, blah. And when you went to France, you know, I, looked, I looked at you sort of around the restaurants and think, these people seem to eat quite a lot of saturated fat to me. In fact, an awful lot. Mm. They slather everything in butter and it's cream and meat, and it's, you know. I mean, the French are known for that, right? For their rich the foods. Are, well, you, well in that. fact, at that time, if you went to a French restaurant and asked for a vegetarian meal, mm. they just took the meat off the plate and gave you what was left. There was no such thing. And there still is. It's very, you know, the, anyway. So I started looking at the, 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 the dietary stuff, and it was clear the French yet more saturated fat than the Scots. Not much more, but a bit more. Um, the cholesterol levels were identical, and the rate of heart disease in Scotland was age-matched five times higher, five times higher. And in fact, Scottish women had higher rates of heart disease than French men, and women are supposed to be protected against heart disease at certain ages. So I began to think, it's not really working this for me. So then I started going into it uh, in more and more detail, really. And I started thinking, well, so how does saturated fat raise cholesterol? And what is cholesterol in your blood anyway? And yeah. all these things that actually seem to be almost impossible for people to find out. And I gradually just came, I, I wrote a couple of papers. I wrote a medical hypothesis paper looking at France and Scotland and saying, you know, there's no difference. The rate of smoking, the French smoked a bit more. The rate of obesity at the time was the same. The cholesterol level, blood pressure, all the standard risk factors. In fact, the standard risk factors were so close together. that I, I like to joke, you can get a cigarette paper between them. But, um, but if anything, they were worse for France. So if you took a French series of risk factors and put them into a risk calculator, which didn't exist at the time, and took the Scottish risk factors on general, put them in a risk factor, the French would score higher. Either way, they should have more heart disease. Mm. Uh, and yet they were getting far less and uh, continued to do so. So I started really beginning to look into this and thinking, you know what? And I read a book called uh, Eat Your Heart Out by a doctor called James Lafanu, who um, writes for the or did write for the Daily Telegraph. And I spoke mm. to him and he basically said the diet part of the hypothesis is bunk. Mm. And I started 
to go into this. It's a bit like the red pill and the blue pill in the matrix, you know. If you take the blue pill, you carry on and everything's fine. You question nothing. The world is makes sense in some weird fashion. You take the red pill and it's like, hold on. Yeah. Oh, hold on. And it, the, um, red, the red pill is scary, I have to say, red pill for is a lot of people. Pill. People yeah. don't want to take the red pill. Anyway. Yeah. So I then began to think, well, if that saturated fat is supposed to raise cholesterol, and cholesterol kills you from heart disease, and this is the primary cause of heart disease. And there is no association between saturated fat consumption and death in any country that I can find. In fact, the exact opposite in many cases. Then surely the cholesterol hypothesis must be resting on shaky foundation, should we say. Mm -hmm. So then I started looking at the, the cholesterol bit of the hypothesis, and I thought, it's not making any sense to me. You know, when someone explains something to you and there's a bit where they go, blah, 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 blah. You may not know they're doing that, but they're doing that. The bit where you say to them, well, why are there no plaques? After if, if raised cholesterol goes into blood vessels and causes them to thicken, yep. why don't veins have atherosclerosis? That's right. Why not? And why don't the blood vessels in your lungs yeah. and why no. not just all along the artery walls yeah. like why not why all not along all the artery wall? wall if yeah. it's absorbing through why is it only absorbing through in certain points so you get a plaque some people die because of one atherosclerotic plaque mm. in one artery in their heart they have everything else is clear one plaque all right you say well well surely that's a that's a problem of that bit of the artery that can't be a work a sort of global problem with cholesterol mm. And of course, if you take a vein from the leg and stick it into the heart and use it as a coronary artery bypass, it very rapidly furs up with atherosclerosis. So there's, veins can develop atherosclerosis. And a vein in a person that has no atherosclerosis can be taken from their leg and put into their heart, whereupon it develops atherosclerosis. So you say, well, there's clearly something about it being in the heart that is, is doing this. Mm. And what is that? What is happening that is here that is not happening there? What's going on? So when you start, I mean, when you say to cardiologists, why don't you get atherosclerosis in veins? They go, blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. They don't answer this question. They just say, oh, it's bad. And you think when someone doesn't have an answer to a question, that you think, I'm going to look at this really, really closely. And I'm going to ask myself, well, why? And then you, you look at there are conditions that children have. Um, well, adults have them, but they tend to sort them out, whereby you have um, shunts in your heart where, where there's a fairly large gap in your heart and the blood pressure from the left side of your heart shoots into the right side of your heart, then goes into your lungs and then increases the blood pressure in your lungs called pulmonary hypertension. And, and if you have this condition, you end up with atherosclerosis in your lungs. So you think, well, what is the difference between somebody who's got this called Eisenmenger's syndrome? What's the difference between this and not this is the level of blood pressure, clearly. Mm. What you call the biomechanical stress or whatever term you want to use. So something's happening to the blood vessel and that something is clearly the thing that triggers the process or, or allows the process to happen. A bit like with a gun, you can't fire it until the safety catch is off. So, so someone's removed the safety catch in, if you take a vein and put it in the heart, and someone's removed the safety catch if you remove, if you've got a hole in your heart that allows the blood pressure to go to high pressure in, in your lungs. And then you can find other things. You look back in history and you say, well, other people have thought this. This is not just me. The, the first ideas around this started in 1852. So that's 170 years ago. So I, I didn't wake up one day with a fully formed hypothesis about all this stuff. It is a guy called Karl von Rokitansky, who was in Vienna in 1852. Um, but but then you start looking and you say, well, actually, a lot of people have had these same ideas over the years. It's just that it's never, ever reached with a critical mass or, or whatever term you want to use. So after the Second World War, there were quite a lot of people who were saying, well, we're looking at there's a guy called Duggett, who was a Scottish researcher, who was looking at in the lungs actually mainly of people and saying, well, what we can see, and in other blood vessels, what we see is you, you see uh, what they call a thrombus or a blood clot blocking a blood vessel. And it can fully block a blood vessel. And you think that's pretty disastrous. And then what happens is little, little pipes of blood vessels start to form and go all the way through this, um, this thrombus. 
And then gradually they form together and become a new tube through which the blood can flow. And then around this, you have a, like a, a sort of wedding or some people call it a wedding ring of, of a blockage, a thinning area. So that certain areas have been, if you like, blocked and then hollowed out. Mm -hmm. And these, as you said, you can see these becoming what we call atherosclerosis. Over time, they turn from a blood clot into atherosclerosis. And then I was looking at a research. I mean, it's amazing you go back and you think no one's ever thought this. I, I like to call it ghosts in the machine. People have thought this stuff. And it was a really interesting research paper from 1955. Um, Unfortunately, if you want to look at research papers from 1955, normally you have to pay about $500 to get access to them. It's ridiculous. Um, oh, the money situation. Anyway, um, so I was looking at this I'll paper. I'll get you started. You know, to get me started. And what, what, what they'd realized, there'd been research where they got animals and they'd injected blood clots into their veins. And then they'd gone up their vein, into their heart, gone through their heart, right side of the heart, and into their lungs, where obviously it gets stuck as the blood vessels get smaller and smaller. And what they found is if you kept injecting blood clots into animal veins in their lungs, they developed atherosclerosis. What was called atherosclerosis? It started mm. off with blood clots. The blood clots gradually transformed and they turned into plaques, atherosclerotic plaques, which is the underlying heart disease thing. And so they said, well, does, can, does this happen in children? And in 1955, they didn't have heart lung transplant machines. There were children who had heart problems and valve problems that they couldn't operate on, but they were firing blood clots into their lungs on a regular basis. And what, what they saw was that these blood clots were coming off the heart, getting into the lungs, blocking in the lungs, and turning into atherosclerotic plaques, or what you would say is an atherosclerotic plaque. So you can see all the, 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 the sort of mechanism of here's a blood clot, it gets blocked, jammed into a blood vessel, and then it turns into a plaque. Now, obviously, that isn't quite happening in the rest of your body, potential, or maybe it is happening in the rest of your body. Um, so you start thinking, well, blood clots can become plaques. We can see that from start to finish. The process is there. You can make them happen by injecting blood clots into our animals. You can see children who have no other reason to have atherosclerosis developing atherosclerosis. And then other people did research more recently showing that people who have Eisenmenger syndrome and who create clots in their lung, in their heart, these will end up in the lungs and they will turn into atherosclerosis. So you have the whole process here and you think, well, why has this not been taken up? And in fact, I was taught, I never realized it at the time, I was taught by um, Elspeth Smith, who was a cardiovascular researcher. Um, a cardiologist and a female was an unknown thing at that time, like a unicorn. And she said at one point to me, in sort of retrospect, she said, LDL, which is what we call cholesterol, LDL, low density lipoprotein, we call it cholesterol, it's just nonsense, cannot get through the endothelium, which is the lining of all blood vessels. Mm -hmm. It is unable to pass through the endothelium. And this kind of comment and this was in a small group tutorial i remember thinking she said that it meant really something that was really significant i don't quite understand why it was significant i didn't know what ldl was and i didn't mm -hmm. know what endothelium was i then started reading some of her stuff in fact i didn't realize it was her i thought e stood for edward i didn't realize it was elspeth but and she made what she said was and this is in 1980 something that Atherosclerosis is basically due to blood clotting. And it, from start to finish, it is blood clotting all the way through, start to finish. She said this. She should have a Nobel Prize. Mm. But she's dead, so she won't. And there have been other researchers. Ronald Ross, was, he was called a um, uh, response to injury hypothesis. What he said was that if the endothelium, the lining of your blood vessels, becomes damaged or disrupted in some way, that um, that, that um, at that point, a blood clot forms on that area because, because obviously the body thinks the, if a blood vessel is damaged, it needs that blood, that may mean I'm about to be bleeding to death. Mm. So I have to block that very quickly. There's normally a blood vessel be damaged, somebody sticks a knife in you or a tiger sticks a claw in you or whatever. 
So you have to stop that bleeding very, very quickly, especially in arteries which have much higher blood pressure. So you have to have a system whereby blood clots form really quickly and they have to be really difficult to sort of remove. Otherwise, there's no point in them. So if you damage the lining of the blood vessel, there's a, there's a substance in your blood vessel, it's called tissue factor, um, which you know, ask 100 doctors, none of them have heard of it. Anyway, it's like Instaclot. Uh, you'll all have heard of factor eight and factor seven and factor nine and factor 10 and all these things. That's a slow clotting system. That's the intrinsic system. The extrinsic system is clot now, here, now, instantly. Okay. So when you disrupt the endothelium, a blood clot will form at that point, bang, stick to that point and it will form, it will be quite big to start with, it'll get shaved down, but it will still be there stuck to the blood vessel wall. It's called a mural thrombus, that's the term for it. And then you ask another question, was, well, well, what happens to it then? Because if that blood vessel that's sticking to the side of an artery was to break off and travel down the artery, it would cause, it could cause a stroke or a heart attack further down the artery or damage to other organs, all sorts of nasty things can happen. So clearly it cannot be allowed to break off. So it's stuck onto the artery wall, however big it may be. What do you do with it? Well, you know, if you scratch your skin, you get a scab and the scab falls off because the skin goes up from underneath and pushes it off really. Well, that doesn't happen in your blood vessels because the, the lining, the endothelium, it's only one layer thick and it cannot come from underneath because there's no underneath. And it can't come from the sides because once an endothelial cell is what they call mature, it doesn't, it can't replicate itself, it's stuck. And so a lot of people have been struggling struggle with this for a while. Well, where does the new endothelium come from? Where, does, what is, where is it from? And they realized in about the mid 1990s, it comes from within your bone marrow. Mm -hmm. It's made in blood, it's made by stem cells. It's called endothelial progenitor cells. They float around in your bloodstream. And if they find an area of damage, they stick onto it and then they grow and they form a new layer of endothelium over the top of the blood clot that's sitting there. So the blood clot is now within your artery wall. And this is an, a thing that, of course, they didn't know originally, which is why Rocky Tansky in 1852 couldn't answer the question, how can your blood clot be underneath the endothelium? Because blood clots form in the bloodstream. They don't form outside the bloodstream. And he couldn't answer that question, um, but he could answer it now, which is, well, actually you get the damage, you get the blood clot, and then the endothelium grows on top of it, reforms, and the blood clot is drawn into the artery wall. Now we know all these things happen. Yeah. This is not in any, none of what I am saying is by the way, will it be contentious when you bring it all together as this is how it happens, but each part of it is not contentious. Yeah. We know and because they looked at people who've got angina and blockages in their arteries in their heart and they scan them every year just to see what progress is happening. And what they found is you don't get a gradual thickening of the clot or the plaque. What happens is one year it's this size and next year it's this size. So it jumps in size. And as they've said, this can only be caused. What has happening is a new blood clots are formed on that area and it's added itself to the underlying plaque. That's how plaques grow. This, that's not contentious. And the final thing that kills you is a blood clot on top of an already existing plaque because of that areas are a bit narrower, the endothelium is a bit more, uh, has more being damaged and the blood flow at that point is turbulent. It's so getting worse this, this and worse becomes, over time. And this becomes, you know, it yeah. becomes a focus, doesn't it? Yeah. So this becomes a focus for blood clotting at that point. Now that's not contentious. The fact that it's a blood clot in the end that clots on top of a previous existing plaque and block, fully blocks an artery and causes mm -hmm. a heart attack or a stroke, that's not contentious. So none of that is content. Mainstream medicine will not will not have any problem if you say these things to them. Mm -hmm. Where they have a problem is you say that's also how it starts. At that point, they go, no, it starts because low density lipoprotein is absorbed through the endothelium, which cannot happen, mm -hmm. yeah. into the artery wall behind, which starts the plaque in the first place. I understand. So you say, well, yeah. And then you, so that's where they defend that. That's a, that's a last defense position. And then okay, you say, just, well, yeah. well how, how does it yeah. go? 
Um, can, oh. can I just cut in just a little bit? Because um, I just want to get my my own story straight in my head. Because as as a layman, um, I just want to kind of make sure that I'm following correctly. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because the, the the current understanding is that um, basically almost like a sewage pipe that's filled with fat. Um, I saw in one of your talks you're like you know that they basically um people um in high places kind of compare the artery wall to how a sewage pipe looks when it's absolutely filled with fat and you know they look the same you know this is what happens so you eat you know saturated fat you eat you know food full of cholesterol you get high cholesterol and they come along and somehow they stick to the um inside of the artery walls go underneath the endothelium like you say and that's basically what happens and um that's kind of the level of thinking that they were using so that's how um having high cholesterol currently um is that's why it's such a problem because i say well if you've got lots of cholesterol then that means ldls that means that it's going to start clogging up the arteries eventually um but basically what you're saying is, is that the LDLs have nothing to do with that. It's actually um, other stuff, like other irritations, like if you were to scratch your skin, it's the same sort of mechanism where, you know, the inside of your artery walls are kind of, you know, irritated and then they inflame and like clots. And um, so so how, do, how does, L, how do LDLs come into that then? Do they, because my understanding of what you were talking about is that um, the LDLs, they are present in the clots um around the area but not be not as but not as fire starters they're there to kind of heal the the to help heal basically rather than being actually the cause of the problem is that correct how do they how did ldls get yeah. stuck into this well uh well ldl everything in the blood there's everything is in a blood clot put it that way right um yeah. many yeah. things many things are in the blood clot that aren't anywhere else like fibrin which is the sticky strands that bind clots together and you find lots of fibrin in plaques, mm. right? So how did that get there? Anyway, the, the, the thinking started because basically they found um, um, a thing called, they found cholesterol in plaques in quite high concentration. They didn't know there was such a thing as an LDL at that time, but then mm. they said, well, where can this have come from? Well, the only place it could have come from is the bloodstream. And that was about as scientific as it got. And it is mm. true that you can find LD, well, actually, the question is, is it true you can find an LDL particle in a blood clot? Because the, the, the um, another issue that, again, 99.9% .9 of doctors are blissfully unaware of is that there is, step back, LDL is a low-density lipoprotein, right? It is, it carries within it cholesterol and, and fats. The cholesterol and the fats are linked together. And when you link a cholesterol and a fat, you get a thing called a cholesterol. So cholesterol, LDL carries cholesterol esters around in the bloodstream. Now, LDLs are not made anywhere, but they are what the, the, the thing that turns into an LDL is made in the liver. It's called a very low density lipoprotein, VLDL. Mm -hmm. You may have heard of that called a triglyceride, which is insane because it's not a triglyceride. It's a bit like calling a car a human being because cars contain human beings. LDL is not cholesterol. It is a vehicle which transports cholesterol and fats around the bloodstream because cholesterol and fat are not soluble in blood. So they have to be put into a, 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 a water soluble sphere called a lipoprotein. Now the liver makes the LDLs it synthesizes them and it sends them out into the bloodstream. And as they travel around the body, they lose the fat and they become higher and higher in concentration of cholesterol. So they have, so say it's 50-50 fat cholesterol. By the time they become an LDL, it's 80-20 or something of the sort. There's another intermediate stage called the intermediate, intermediate density lipoprotein. Yeah, the terminology is crackers, but anyway. Um, so an LDL is, is a sp little tiny sphere. It's about the size of a virus, actually, interestingly. Maybe they were viruses at one time. Um, but the, anyway, the surrounding, the surrounding lipoprotein thing is exactly the same as they use for the, for the SARS-CoV vaccines. Um, because they know that they can stick to cell walls and then the whole thing gets absorbed. Um, that's why they did it that way. Um, so it, 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 nothing is new under the world. Anyway, 
<laughs> so an, LD, an LDL is, if an LDL was the size of a human being, a cell would be about the size of a major sports stadium, just to give you some example of the scale, about Wembley or something on the Super Bowl or wherever it is. Mm -hmm. And um, so they carry around, and in fact, they can't directly get into cells because, because cells don't let things in unless they want them in. So the cell produces a receptor for LDL that sticks, it doesn't actually stick mm -hmm. out of the cell wall. Anyway, it's in the cell wall, the LDL comes along, locks onto it, and the whole thing gets dragged into the cell. And that is how LDL gets into a cell, through an LDL receptor. And, mm -hmm. and of course, the discovery by Goldstein and Brown in 1974, I think it was, that pe some people did not have enough LDL receptors, and therefore the level of the LDL went up and up and up. And it's, that's, that's the basis of familiar hypercholesterolemia, which should really be called hyper ldl mm. um, and 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 therefore so the, so the receptor is required all right so when you're saying to someone um well okay then so how does ldl get through the endothelial cell from the bloodstream to the artery wall because the cell would have to absorb it take it into the cell travel it across the cell we a bit like walking all the way across wembley stadium turning itself inside out the other side and popping the LDL out into the artery wall. Mm -hmm. Now that now there is a system that allows molecules to be transported across cells, which is incredibly clever. I, I always find it like, uh, this is all amazingly clever. It's called trans transcytosis. But transcytosis doesn't work for LDL. Um, so the only way you could get it would be between the um, endothelial cells. And you say, well, maybe it slips through the gap. And you go, well, I've got news for you because when cells are next to each other, they link very tightly together. And then they have about 5,000 protein strands stuck. And that it's a bit like saying you could get between two terraced houses. Mm. No, you can't. Although they are two separate houses, they are actually linked together by bricks all the way through. Yeah, so it's not and in fact, so, so they're really called tight junctions. And tight junctions... Are required for life. If these tight junctions didn't exist, if anything in the bloodstream could just go straight through uh, past the endothelium and in, into the tissues and organs behind, you would be dead like that. Mm, right. And and we know you would be dead because there is a disease where that happens, and that's called Ebola. Right. And the Ebola virus, for whatever reason, it opens up tight junctions between endothelial cells and allows everything to escape. That's why it's called hemorrhagic fever and your eyeballs go bloody and things go bloody because your entire body disintegrates at that point. That's how it kills you. And it kills you because it opens up tight junctions. So we know that if tight junctions are not tight, you die. Yes, yes. And yet the, the argument is, oh, well, the LDL goes between, between cells through these tight junctions where there is no junction. These tight junctions stop single ions which would be like the size of a grain of sand next to a human being. Yeah. yeah. So, so it can control the passage of a grain of sand, yet it can't control the passage of a human being. Though this is clearly nonsensical. Yeah. It just absolutely yeah. makes no sense. So people say, oh, well, um, well, the junctions open up. And you go, well, I can believe if you've damaged the junction, if you've damaged endothelial cells, the junctions will open up, but then everything can get through. Yeah. Red blood cells, white blood cells, water, albumin, you name it, it's through. It's rushing through and, and everything will go through. All right. Yeah. So why just LDL? Why is it specifically one molecule, a yeah. very large molecule, yeah. a huge molecule? Why is it this one that can go through and nothing else? So basically, you're saying, is, it's just, it's, it's not, yeah. Yes. No, basically, you're saying, yes, no sense. <laughs> makes no sense. Yeah. It's not scientific. You're saying it's, it's just like they reverse possible. engineered this yeah. hypothesis. They decided LDL causes heart disease, mm -hmm. and therefore the only way it can do it is if it. Uh, and the other thing that it 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 takes part in a process that does not exist, right? Mm. Um, and then the other thing that people don't know is that all <clears> blood vessels uh, are supplied. Large blood vessels are supplied by their own blood vessels called vasa vasorum, the blood vessels of the blood vessels. Wow, I did not know that. Yeah. And in your big arteries, the arteries that get atherosclerosis sized, little blood vessels form a lattice work around the blood vessel and they go into the blood vessel and they move all the way around in the blood vessel to provide it with the nutrients it needs, otherwise it would die. Mm -hmm. And 
the interesting thing is, and whilst I've talked about this barrier function, once blood vessels get very small, the barrier function starts to break down, as it has to, because in very small blood vessels in your kidneys, for example, if the waste products couldn't leak out and into the nephron and all that, yeah. kidneys couldn't work. All that would happen is the blood would go into the kidney and come out of the kidney and nothing would have happened. Yeah. But when it, very small, very small blood vessels, they have things called fenestrations, which fenestra a window, they've mm. got holes in them. And, and the basement underlying them opens up so things can move in and out of very small blood vessels. So everything, so all arteries and all veins, there's more vasovasorum and veins, are filled with vasovasorum from which all sorts of things can leak in and out, mm. including, of course, LDL. So actually, why doesn't the LDL leak out from behind, if you like, into the artery wall? Or, or and if it's doing that, why doesn't it do in the vein wall? Yeah. And Again, if you asked 100 doctors and they heard of the vase of his aura, 99.9 would, would never have heard of this stuff. And when they were doing this research originally, when the hypothesis existed, they didn't know there was vase of his aura. They didn't know there was LDL. They didn't know there were tight junctions. They'd never heard of transcytosis. They didn't know, almost, they didn't know there were endothelial progenitor cells. They didn't, had never heard of nitric oxide. They'd, just about nothing. They knew nothing about but, but how before the, So when the hypothesis started, they didn't know about these terms. They knew none of these things. So, no. so they must have integrated it. They must have gone with the hypothesis. They're like, this is the hypothesis now. We're going to go with it. And then as they were discovering these new, um, you know, LDLs and all of these terms that you've been using, as they've been kind of discovering them, they've had to kind of fit them in to yeah. the puzzle well, somehow. Well, they haven't really bothered, you know. Yeah. It's just like, well, yeah, all that stuff, but it's still the same thing. It, they didn't even heard. There's another thing that uh, no one's ever heard of. It's called the glycocalyx, which is a gigantically important physiological structure in your body. As I say, if you try and pick up a fish, most fish, not sharks, you try and pick up a fish, it slips between your fingers. Mm. It slips between your fingers because it's covered in a thing called glycocalyx, which is a thousand times slippier than Teflon, right? right? And it's made up of little strands of, of of protein and sugar it's called glyco um yeah glycoproteins and it's a little wavy forest and, it, and it, it's designed to protect the underlying endothelium from things banging into it it's also incredibly anticoagulant so everything can smoothly move over it and inside it there's all sorts of hormones and enzymes it's just a gigantically complicated thing and it sits there and it, and one of the things if the glycogelic actually can stop viruses getting into cells it can block them from getting into cells so people who have damage of glycocalyx are more likely to have viral infections. So diabetes damages your glycocalyx. Mm -hmm. Diabetes increases your risk of COVID. And, you know, and it all adds together. But they never heard of the glycocalyx. I mean, like almost everything about the endothelial cell, they were thought to be like wall tiles or something. Yeah, yeah. They just sat there and kind of acted as a barrier. And that was it. They're probably, in fact, they're, no, they're probably the most complicated cells in your body. Right. And they just, this idea that they would just, oh, look, here comes an LDL molecule. Well, I tell you what, I'll just let it go straight through me and into the artery wall. Or I, I tell you what, I'll just let it go straight past me and another cell and into the artery wall. And I'm only going to do this in certain parts of the artery wall because, because, because why? Yeah. Because so, what are you talking about? You know, I mean, everything you're talking about it, with all this information that you have access to now and that we know, it sounds almost ridiculous that this, um, you know, the fact that LDL cholesterol is the cause of, you know, blood clots and heart disease and so on. Um, it's, it's almost sounds ridiculous that this is still allowed to happen. So why, why do you think it's still, why are they still holding on to it? What's, why don't they just drop it? This is going to be a really obvious question, but why don't they just drop it? Why are they holding on to this? Well, no one apparently has got a better idea which is nonsense because plenty of people have had a better idea. Second reason, huge sums of money. I mean, you mm, lower cholesterol. That's right. Statins may have made a trillion dollars, mm. possibly, in profit. There's new cholesterol-lowering, LDL-lowering agents coming out all the time, um, and they get promoted hugely. And then there's the entire low-fat, saturated fat um, industry that makes right. yeah. another, more trillions by selling rubbish, low fat high carb foods to people and make vast sums of money out of it so there's definitely that yeah and 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 then there's just um inertia I mean, people have an idea yeah. they like it i mean it, you gotta face it, it is a simple idea you eat too much saturated fat 
mm. and it gets turned into cholesterol. Well, we'll ignore that bit. Anyway, <laughs> you know it's saturated fat and it's gunky stuff. Clogs and up it's your gunky arteries. Gunky stuff gets into your bloodstream and gunks up your arteries. Yeah. In some gunky way that actually makes no scientific sense whatsoever. It does not meet. I mean, I tell you what happens when you eat saturated fat or any fat mm. is 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 it it goes into your obviously into your small bowel. Bile, which is cholesterol, comes and links to it. Otherwise, the body can't absorb it. The bile links to the fats. It's absorbed into your small bowel. It's put into a really big like protein called the chylomicron, which is maybe it's the size of a beach ball if an LDL is the size of a tennis ball. Mm -hmm. This then is delivered straight into your bloodstream through a thing called the thoracic duct. And uh, the thoracic, then it goes around the body, losing all the saturated, all the fats. And then it shrinks down and down and down and down and down till it becomes about the size of an LDL molecule, at which point it's absorbed into the liver, broken down, and it's gone. That's what happens to fat. It's really simple, right? And that has nothing to do. It's just like where where is the connection with LDL? There, uh, there isn't any. Yeah, you're right. There isn't any. There is no connection whatsoever. Yeah. It has nothing to do with LDL. So how is VLDL? Well, if you eat carbohydrates, they are transported directly into your liver, right? All of them. They they are turned in basically into fructose and glucose, just about entirely. Uh, simple sugars they go into your liver and if your liver is full of fructose is then turned into glucose because your body doesn't like fructose very much once your liver is full of glucose uh, it goes it turns it into glycogen which is just mm -hmm. lots of glucose molecules all stuck together a bit like starch and once your liver is full of glucose and glycogen and it can't take any more it says what am i going to do with it mm -hmm. and what it does with it is it turns it into fat Right. It transfers it into fat and it makes it into fat. It's called, it's called um, lipogenesis. Lipo fat genesis to create. Lipogenesis comes from sugars. Sugar, sugar, sugar. So if you eat carbohydrate, it goes into your liver. And once your liver is full and once your muscles are full, and you can store about 1500 calories that way ish, mm -hmm. at that point, your body has no choice. It turns it all into fat. All right. And it turns it into fat and it sticks it into a VLDL molecule along with cholesterol and pops it out. And then the fat in the VLDL is got rid of until it turns into an LDL. And then once 99% of LDL is just reabsorbed into the liver where it's broken down and reutilized re again. So you say, well, what makes VLDL go up? Well, what makes VLDL go up is eating too many carbohydrates. Right. Because basically, you just said, yeah, it, like if VLDL, someone has. Yeah. high hazard has, has a diet high in yeah. carbohydrates so we're looking at um i mean if you look at what we're recommended to eat about 50 to 60 percent of our carbohydrate recommendations are carbohydrates and uh, know, yeah pastas, our calorie, our calorie breads, recommendations. vegetables fruits um so basically you're saying that it's that that can bump up your ldls rather than the saturated fat which yeah. we're only recommended to have about 10 percent from memory well, whatever, I believe. Percent, whatever stupid yeah figure it, it, it varies from one stupid figure to another and um yes so but the interesting thing is of course everybody i remember discussing this with a professor of biochemistry i was having a is the english breakfast good for you argument he he was like no we should all be eating croissants and we a bit someone and I was like looking at him thinking, what? Anyway, I said to him, well, if you eat too many carbohydrates, it's converted into fat. The fat is converted into VLDLs, triglycerides. The triglycerides go around your body, losing their fat, and they're turned into LDLs. LDL goes back into your, into your liver where it's re reused. The various proteins and things it needs are reused. And he said, how do you know that? I went, well, I read it. <laughs> I said, and, and I spoke to people. Um, and he didn't seem to know that this was the case. So I was looking at him thinking, you're a professor of bio lipidology. Anyway, but it was almost like he couldn't say this because once you start saying this to people, they go, so if you eat carbohydrates, your LDL must go up. You go, no, it doesn't actually. It's interesting. But your VLDL is here. And the only source of LDL is this. Your VLDL goes here and your LDL stays rigidly here. All right. What does this tell you, gentle reader? It tells you that the liver can control the level of LDL and does so, and it does it very easily. And it, it really makes no difference what your VLDL does to your LDL. Yeah. 
-hmm. because the, the, the liver doesn't care. It controls the LDL level. It, it puts out more receptors, it pulls it in, it takes it in as needed. What does this tell you? Well, it tells you that some people with familiar hypercholesterolemia, which I talked about earlier, where you don't have LDL receptors. And there's a very rare condition where you have both genes. So your LDL is like, if, if your normal is three, then you've got 30 and 40 or whatever. If you do a liver transplant on these children, the LDL level becomes normal like that. So straight like that. You said, well, why is that? It's because the liver controls your LDL level, you idiots. Mm. Well, that's the only possible solution. And, and it has nothing to do with the amount of saturated fat you eat. Nothing to do with the amount of saturated fat you eat. Right. And people say, ah, oh, but if you give people polyunsaturated fats, the LDL level goes down. I said, yes, it does go down. And do you know the reason for that? And they don't, because they don't read anything. Is that polyunsaturated fats and oils have a lot of things called stanols in them. You might have heard of stanols and sterols. Yes, I have, yeah. And, yeah. Plant stanols lower your cholesterol. Mm -hmm. well, they don't actually lower your cholesterol. Are you speaking of vegetable oils right vegetable now? Vegetable oils, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, the vegetable oils themselves, but within that are the vegetable stanols. Mm. Because cholesterol is found in all, is found in cell membranes, which are what animals have. And in cell walls, which is what plants have, they have a thing called a stanol or a sterol, which is the, they're interchangeably used. Now, cholesterol is actually a form of stanol or sterol. It's just that we don't tend to call it that. So if you eat lots of vegetables and stuff, you get a lot of stanols and sterols, and the body absorbs these instead of cholesterol, all right? And then it, then it deals with them differently, and your LDL level drops because of this, because the liver's not getting enough cholesterol. It's getting stanols and sterols. It's not the saturated fat that makes your LDL go up. It's the stanols and sterols, and the way they're dealt with in the liver that makes your LDL go down because the liver is reabsorbing it more rapidly. Yeah. So it's got nothing to do with, I mean, it's all this, I mean, again, it's like you speak to people, you don't know this stuff, do you? You, you know none of these things. I mean, I, I feel I do feel like sometimes I'm saying to them, if you keep reading for 15 years, you might know about half of what I know about this stuff. And you're arguing with me, you've never even heard, you don't even know what a stano is. You don't know what a VLDL is. You've no idea how saturated fat is dealt with in the body. You don't even know where a D LDL molecule comes from. You yeah. don't know what it contains. You know nothing about it. And yet you're telling me this is how heart disease works. Yeah. You go, fine. Just, you know, I do find myself thinking, what are you doing? You know, this is just yeah. ridiculous. I, yeah, I can I can feel that from you right now. But I, I, I'm also just right now, I'm thinking about um, clients of mine. I'm thinking about my parents. I'm thinking about all of the people who have ever come to me saying, oh, I've just been to the doctor. My cholesterol is really high. So um, we're warned that having high LDLs, high triglycerides, low HDLs um, are risk factors for heart disease. So are you basically saying that looking at cholesterol is not an indicator of heart disease whatsoever? Well, it depends what you call, decide to call cholesterol because VLDLs and HDLs, high density lipoproteins, mm -hmm. and we've got onto that as well. High density lipoproteins are supposed to be protective against heart disease, although in some studies they are not, but let's mm -hmm. not go down that route. But actually, if you've got a high VLDL level and a low HDL level, that means you've got insulin resistance. I see. Yeah. And you're eating too many carbohydrates. Right? So so looking at your cholesterol is a good indicator of heart well, disease, but not in the way <laughs> that people think. Well, the, the, the LDL is the thing that people are focused on saying that's, that's right. the one that causes yeah. heart disease. You go, well, actually, A, it's not cholesterol. Stop calling it cholesterol. It's just stupid. Um, B, it's got nothing to do with the rate of heart disease. See, if you decide to include the LDLs and HDL in your, but actually, when, you know, when you get given your what you call your total cholesterol level, mm. that includes your VLDL, your HDL, and your LDL. Your VLDL level is divided by five, for reasons unknown to man. Um, your HDL is calculated, and then what's left is considered to be your LDL. It's called mm -hmm. the Friedwald equation. It's horribly inaccurate. You go to three laboratories and ask for your total cholesterol, your your your, your VLDL and your HDL, and you'll get a different answer from all of them, mm -hmm. not even within 30%. I'll guarantee I've done it. Um, these are not accurate tests. Um, but yes, if you decide that your total cholesterol is high, if that's made up of high VLDL, you, you have another problem. It's not the VLDL that's causing you to have heart disease. It's just telling you 
this is the 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 argument of yellow fingers and and lung cancer which you may or may not have heard no. people with yellow fingers are more likely to die of lung cancer okay amazingly enough yeah did you not know that know. why is this it's because they smoke does that I, give I you yellow yes. finger all right <laughs> so i missed that one yeah, yeah. you know so it's a classic epidemiology thing now. so the question is when you're looking at when you look at it vldl is high people have higher rates of heart disease yes and well, because if you've got insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome, you'll have high VLDL levels. That's the thing that's causing the heart disease, right. not the VLDL. Yeah. If you've got a low HDL, well, that's another, because actually as VLDL comes out of the liver, HDL comes up to it and swaps like things, other proteins on the surface of them in order that the VLDL can be recognized by receptors around the body and therefore the HDL level drops. So the higher your VLDL level goes, automatically the lower your HDL level goes their associated levels and so one goes up one goes down the ldl level stays the same the calculated figure appears to be the same but you've got a completely different problem going on if you like and, and yet people have just said oh it's cholesterol and a, it's not cholesterol b there are dis different things and then there's another lipoprotein that no one's even mentioned yet which is called lipoprotein a and again guarantee anyone listening to this go and ask your doctor what's lpa they will not know um the lpa is a ldl molecule with a specific protein attached to the side of it called apolipoprotein a and there's a really interesting whole story about apolipoprotein a mm -hmm. which is to do with the fact that it is highly involved in regulating blood clots and you cannot find it in animals or you find hardly any of it in animals that that manufacture their own vitamin C. Mm -hmm. You think, well, where does this story go? Well, vitamin C, all right, this may seem like a side of it. It comes back around, don't worry, we'll get there in the end. Vitamin C, a lack of vitamin C goes a scurvy, right? Nobody, nobody knows what scurvy is. But what scurvy is, is, is because vitamin C is required for the body to make collagen. You may have heard of collagen. Yes. Sharks, yes. Made, it, sharks made of collagen, not bone. And it's really... Are we like just this, based, aren't we made of collagen mostly, like fascia, sorry? muscles? Are we made of like collagen mostly? All, yeah. without, without collagen, we would just be a disintegrated mush, right? That's right, yeah. We would just, we would, well, we'd have bones, but the rest of us would just be mush. But the first, one of the first organs or parts of the body that needs collagen in order to not break down are blood vessels. If you don't have enough collagen, your blood vessels start to crack. Mm. And one of the first signs of scurvy is your gums bleed because your blood vessels are breaking open. Right. And then you bleed internally and then you die of internal bleeding, All right. which is a pretty nasty way to go. And um, um, so you can't make vitamin C. Now, there's, there's about 10 or 9 animals that can't make their own vitamin C. Guinea pigs, some great apes, some weird things that I can never remember the name of, and us. You think, well, why don't we make vitamin C? It seems silly. Um, it's made from glucose, by the way. And um, it looks almost like a glucose molecule. So if you can't make vitamin C and you don't get vitamin C, your blood vessels start to break down and then you die of bleeding to death. So the body at some point came up with a patch and said, if we're breaking down, can we stick things to the side of blood vessels to stop them cracking? And the thing they use is, is LPA, lipoprotein A. That's the sticky stuff that forms like super glues your artery walls together. Now, how that does it is incredibly complicated. I'm not going into it. But uh, they did some experiments once on guinea pigs who can't make vitamin C, and they, they got all the vitamin C out of their diet. Then they started to develop atherosclerosis in their blood vessels, which guinea pigs don't normally do. Then they gave them the vitamin C back, and the atherosclerosis disappeared. And this experiment has been done in the history of the world precisely once, and uh, never again, Gosh. which you'd think would be quite interesting to be done again. I mean, you yeah. can't do this sort of, you can't do this sort of experiment on human beings. Let's, you know, let's make them all vitamin C deficient and see see how quickly they die. Um, so the same thing happens in human beings. Now, LPA is that one of the lipoproteins and it is part of the whole measurement, although no one will tell you, will give you the, the actual figure unless you are specifically for it. But it's really important. It is actually the lipoprotein that is important because when you look at, plaques and people say oh they've got lots of LDL in them the answer is no they don't have lots of LDL in them 
what they have is lots of LPA in them. And how would you know the difference? Because the, the basic structure molecule of LDL is exactly the same. The only difference is that LPA has this protein wrapped around it called apolipoprotein A. And if you don't look for that protein, you wouldn't know if it's LDL or LPA. And no one looks for this protein, but some people have looked for this protein, right. including Elspeth Smith, including, unfortunately, Matthias Rath, um, who you may or may not have heard of. Um, if you've heard of him, he's a very controversial figure. He's the one that went to South Africa and said that there's no such thing as HIV and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, I actually hadn't heard of him, but oh, yeah, he's worth, worth, no, 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 worth no, no, looking no. up. Well, uh, well, he worked with uh, Linus Pauling, who became the vitamin C man at one point. And, and he was the one that said, well, I've looked at, you know, when they, when they did coronary artery bypass surgery and they take out the old artery and then they look at it and say, look at all these plaques and they examine them. He examined them and said, so what's, what's in here? Is it LDL or is it LPA? Right. And the only way you can tell is if you look for this stain for this particular apolipoprotein A. And what he found was that, well, well, there it is. There it is. It's there and it's there in plaques in high concentrations. Right. So what's in plaques is, is most likely LPA. Not LDL. Right? Not LDL. And that would make sense because LPA is designed to plug damaged areas of artery wall. And people with a high LPA level are far more likely to die from heart disease than, than people with a high LDL level, for instance. So of course, when clots form, LPA, LDL, the whole thing, they all get rammed together inside the clot in quite high concentrations. So there's a part of the argument. The other thing is the years back when they found what they thought was cholesterol in plaques, what they were seeing was cholesterol crystals, all right? And you may think, well, where did that come from? That must have gone from LDL because that's got cholesterol in them. The answer is, again, it's like everything you look at, you can turn it around and say, no, no, you've looked at it this way, but actually you're wrong because it's this way. Yeah. Turn it around 180 degrees. The one place a cholesterol crystal cannot come from is an LDL molecule. Because as I said before, cholesterol in LDL is linked to fats as a cholesterol ester. It is not cholesterol. It is cholesterol ester, different chemical. You can't make cholesterol crystals from cholesterol esters. You can't. So where does the cholesterol crystals come from? So they're there. I'm not, I, I fully accept there's lots of cholesterol crystals in quite a load of plaques. And so well, that yeah. must have come from LDL because they carry cholesterol around. No, they don't. They carry cholesterol esters around. What carries cholesterol, pure cholesterol around in the body? Where is the only place you can find it? The only place you can find it. Have a guess. Oh gosh, I, I couldn't guess right now. <laughs> I'm still no, processing you everything you've just said. Um, right. Arteries. No, the only place you can find the cholesterol in its pure form is in the membranes of red blood cells. Red blood cells. Right. And the reason cells. it's there is because it's really complicated to get oxygen in and CO2 out, and it needs a very, very careful construction of the membrane for this to happen, and that requires pure cholesterol. It's the only place you can find it intercalated, it's got intercalated in between the two parts of the membrane is pure cholesterol, all right? So the only place you can get cholesterol crystals from is red blood cells. Mm. And, uh, and, and what do you find in blood clots in very high concentrations? It's red blood cells. So the only place that cholesterol crystals could have come from inside a plaque and people find these things is from red blood cells being incorporated into the blood vessel wall. And the only place that can come from was a blood clot. Right. So pe people have looked at, at, at lipoproteins and said, oh, look at all that LDL, wrong, it's LPA. People have looked at the cholesterol crystals and said, oh my God, that must have come from LDL because that's what cholesterol comes from, wrong. They're cholesterol esters. It comes from red blood cells. That's the only place it can come from. And I've read about 20 papers that have said this. All right? mm -hmm. They've said this, this is interesting because this is the only place it can come from. And how much impact has this had on mainstream thinking about blood, about, um, about plaques and the rest? None. None. And yet they'll still say, oh, well, we, you know, plaques are made of cholesterol. No, there is cholesterol in there. It, Cholesterol is also an incredibly important molecule for the for for, for um, healing. 
It'll yeah, be like saying yeah. fires are caused by fire engines because every time you get a fire, look at all these fire engines. Go. That's one way of looking at it. I agree. It's just a stupid wrong way around looking at it. Yeah. And this is the whole thing has been always. They've looked at it and gone, oh look at all the LDL. It's not LDL. Oh look at all the cholesterol. Well, it's not. It's not cholesterol. It's, oh look at this. No, stop, you idiots. And yeah. The, the only reason you believe this is because it's the only way your hypothesis works. But each part of it is there's, there's 12 nonsense parts to the LDL cholesterol hypothesis. Yeah. Each one of which is scientifically bunk. And yet it is widely believed. Why is it widely believed? There's another reason why it's I'll just go into this stuff for about five minutes. There's another reason why this is widely believed is because people with familiar hypercholesterolemia, um, in other words, very, very high LDL levels, are thought uh, have a rate of dying of heart disease between the ages of 20 and 39, 100 times that of the surrounding population, 100 times. That's the kind of fact that makes people sit up and pay attention. And you say, oh, well, how does that contradict everything you've just said? said? Well, actually, it doesn't. Again, you can look at it in one way and say that must have been the LDL and it caused the heart disease in these young people. Well, the first thing you've got to remember is hardly anybody dies of heart disease between 20 and 39. Mm -hmm. The figures actually come from a thing called the Simon Broom Registry in the United Kingdom. And the total number of deaths on that figure is based. It's five five deaths and what we found and i've written papers on this with other people is that people with familiar hypercholesterolemia um and they have raised ldl levels and people said it's the ldl level that causes the heart disease well the first thing you find is the ldl receptor itself is incredibly important in blood clotting because it removes various blood clotting factors from the bloodstream including factor eight and just mm -hmm. give you one of them also the LDL receptor gene is very close to many other blood clotting genes, including levels of fibrinogen in your blood, which is another blood clotting factor. And you can find two, you can find twins, one of whom's got the high LDL level, yeah. and the other who's not got the high LDL level, right? But they're genetically otherwise the same, or not entirely the same, they never are. And you find the heart disease rate is the same in these people. This has got nothing to do with the LDL. This is the yellow fingers and smoking. And once you've decided LDL is the cause, I had a chap write to me and his LDL level was 19. The normal LDL level is about three. He was six times the normal, right? And he said, no one's ever discovered any heart disease. I have no heart disease. And because I've examined him in minute detail since the age of about 30, he's now mm -hmm. 70. And so, and, 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 and the, the argument is, they say, well, this gentleman with this enormously high LDL level doesn't have heart disease, he must be being protected by something. No. If LD, there's another explanation is that LDL doesn't cause heart disease. That explanation actually fits. He's not being protected against anything. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it, it, yeah. Can I just ask you, because I'm a functional medicine student and um, they, they agree that looking at um, LDLs is not important. It's um, you know, looking at other factors um, like waist to hip ratio and um, blood pressure and things like that. But um, they basically, um, when it comes to familial hypercholesterolemia, um, they say, well, this is a special case. And in this case, they do need to reduce their levels of saturated fat in their diet. And, um, you know, regarding the mechanism for that, you know, um, I, I, can't quite bring it to my mind right now but that's basically the guidelines that we're being taught so i i presume you're just like it's nothing to do with ldl how many times do i have to say it saturated fat has nothing to do with it um so basically you're saying with you know familial hypercholesterolemia um the high ldl level um is not important no um so what is the link there between um people who are um who have this condition and um, who then go on to have heart attacks at a young age. Um, apologies if you've just gone through it, um, but just uh, in yeah. layman's terms. In layman's terms, yeah. a subset of them. Right. Right. If you yes. have familiar hypercholesterolemia, you will live just as long as everybody else on average. Okay. It does not reduce your life expectancy. There is a subset of, of, of people who have a high rate of heart disease, a very small group of these people. These people mm -hmm. have blood clotting abnormalities which is closely associated with their familiar hypercholesterolemia. Mm -hmm. I see, I see, yeah. 
All right. So you're looking at the wrong thing. Yeah. Right? So it's more the blood clotting issue yeah. rather than the LDL itself. Yes. It, yeah. It okay. isn't the LDL. I mean, yeah. you can see that. And, and I, we've written papers about this. Yeah. Saying it's not the LDL. All right. Mm. There are other conditions. A condition called Hughes disease, Hughes syndrome, which you've never, probably never heard of. Called antiphospholipid syndrome, which you've probably never heard of. Um, and basically the, the cell membranes, the body decides it doesn't like phospholipids which make your cell mm. membranes and starts attacking them and because of that blood clots form more readily around your blood body and these people have a far far higher risk of cardiovascular disease at a young age than anybody with familiar hypercholesterolemia mm -hmm. yet we don't screen for it we don't even know about it most people have never heard of it mm -hmm. so it's you know you can look at other conditions and you can see we could turn it around and say here are other conditions which we know are associated with a far higher risk of cardiovascular disease and they don't have raised LDL. There's nothing LDLish about them. So, so are you saying that people who have higher risk, like familial hypercholesterolemia, and then the the other conditions that you're referencing, um, would you say that these group, this group of people, need to just be extra careful when it comes to, let's say, carbohydrates? Like, are you saying that that they well, need they, to be they careful be, than be, people, more careful than other people? Yeah. People with FH have more likelihood of their blood clotting mm, yeah. rapidly. And if you um, if you if you end up with diabetes or metabolic syndrome, your blood is more clottable. Um, mm -hmm. In part because if you've got diabetes, the thing I talked about earlier, the glycocalyx, which is this forest of stuff yeah. that stops blood clot, that thins down, and actually you your blood is much more likely to clot mm -hmm. in various places. You become what they call hypercoagulable to a degree. And therefore, hypercoagulable means blood clotting. Yes. So people with diabetes are more likely to get heart disease. They don't have raised LDL. Yeah. So their blood is hypercoagulable. They'll have raised the LDL and they'll have low HDL, but there'd be nothing to do with their LDL. Yeah. So when you look at it, it's like, um, yeah, well, it, the condition that yeah, has the highest risk of, of cardiovascular disease in absolute figures is, is sickle cell anemia. If you've ever heard of that, yes, yeah, and that's where you have sharp, pointy red blood vessels that look like a crescent. Yes, yes, and these misshapen red blood red red blood cells are charging around your body, running into your blood vessel walls regularly. Yeah. The increased risk of dying of cardiovascular sorry, hearts and inflammation, yeah. and yeah, exactly. The increased risk of dying of cardiovascular disease young if you've got sickle cell disease is mm -hmm. an increase of 50,000 percent. Wow, compared to even if you take the most outrageous figures, about 1.18 percent if you've got um, if you've got uh, high LDL or familiar hypercholesterolemia. So, you're going to say, let's look at the look at those figures. Here's here are people. There's another condition called SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus. You've probably heard it called lupus. Yes. Much yeah. younger women more than men. It increases the risk of dying of cardiovascular disease by 5,000%. Right, 5,000%. Which, is, although it sounds hugely dramatic, but the number of people who die of heart disease when they're age 40 is quite low. Right. So 5,000% of a very small figure is, is still not huge, but it's still an enormous risk. What is the problem in SLE is the blood vessels are damaged. They've got, and, and the, the blood clots form on these blood vessels, and this is what kills people. Mm -hmm. So looking at the other way around, to turn it the other way around and say, I can find all sorts of conditions that have nothing to do with LDL that will kill you from heart disease. LDL has no part to play. It, and nothing to nothing do with, that, to, with saturated fat either, nothing to do or with... Or saturated fat, yeah. right? So yeah. it's... Um, the hypothesis up. doesn't fit almost any of the facts mm -hmm. at all. You know, why did COVID nineteen kill people from heart disease? What was that? What was that going? Mm -hmm. What was going on there? Right. So, did it affect the LDL levels? No. What it did do was that COVID infected endothelial cells primarily. It killed them. They burst open. At those points, blood clots were formed. Mm -hmm. And so people were having heart attacks and strokes and kidney problems and whatever from blood clotting. So yeah. COVID was causing blood clotting. Yeah. That is periodontal disease increased the risk of cardiovascular disease. 
you get inflamed gums, right? What's that got to do with LDL? Nothing, right? Mm. How does that increase the risk of heart disease? Because when you've got periodontal disease, the bacteria in your gums release toxins, exotoxins, into your bloodstream. These attack the endothelial cells and cause blood clotting around your body. So whatever, if you want to look at a condition and say that raises the risk of heart disease and say, is there an association with blood clotting? The answer is, well, yes, there is. Every single mm. time. All right? Yeah, yeah. So if LDL isn't the problem then, and you've already mentioned that um, diabetes and any condition that relates to blood clotting, um, they are all um, ways that can lead to heart disease and to, um, you know, dying of a heart attack. What other things should we be looking out for? What are the risk factors then? Well, it's just, in, in, in the book, the you know, clock thickens, I've said, what are the, what are the, 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 on a global scale, the biggest problems for causing it? Well, like, obviously yeah. smoking is a big problem. Right? So yes. How does smoking yeah. cause? Does that raise your LDL? No. So how does it cause heart disease? Well, the answer is, Smoke nanoparticles get into your lungs, get through your lungs, and go into your bloodstream. And when they encounter endothelial cells, they kill them. We know this; we can see this. It can be measured. All right. Mm -hmm. So smoking damages the endothelium. All right. High blood pressure damages the endothelium. High blood sugar levels damage the endothelium. Various heavy metals like lead and cadmium and various toxins damage the endothelium. So anything that can damage the endothelium or the glycocalyx. Can increase your risk of dying of heart disease. And would you say stress as well, because stress that by default is, leads to high blood pressure and like stress causes yeah. also it raises your blood sugar, it raises yeah. your blood pressure, it, it causes your arteries to tighten, it it, it releases various things like angiotensin two that are damaging mm -hmm. to your endothelium. It, it it can lead to you know problems with your blood sugar level, metabolic syndrome, and central obesity that can all damage your endothelium. Mm -hmm. When it comes down to it, if you say is is a question for you. Does it damage the endothelium? Yes. Then it will increase the risk of heart disease. Does it make blood clots bigger and stickier and more difficult to get rid of? Yes. It will increase your risk of heart disease. Got it. Does it interfere with the repair systems that allow the areas of damage to be properly dealt with and got rid of? Yes. It will increase your risk of heart disease. So there's three questions you've got to ask. One, does it damage the endothelium? Yes. It will increase your risk of heart disease. Does it cause blood clots to be bigger and more difficult and to, to get rid of? Yes. Does it interfere with the repair systems? Yes. So the most classic one of the repair systems is, um, is well, stress does that. You know, steroids do that. Steroids interfere with your repair systems. They dampen down inflammation, but inflammation is all about healing. Inflammation, you can say it's a bad thing or a good thing. It's, it's both, both things, really. Yeah. But when you take... Uh, autoimmune suppressants like you know if you take uh, chemotherapy if you take steroids if you take any of these types of drugs that will increase your risk of heart disease so it's specifically avastin which you may have heard of which is used mm -hmm. for cancers and avastin um, what it does is um, there's a substance called endothelial growth factor which means your vascular endothelial growth factor which means that your endothelium are repaired and nitric oxide goes up and it's all very healthy and whatever. But that's required to make new little blood vessels. So when a tumor grows, it releases um, vascular endothelial growth factor to make the blood vessels that are allows to feed it with nutrients so it can continue growing. Mm -hmm. So you give a vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitor and it stops the blood vessels from growing, right? So the tumor shrivels up and dies. And it works quite well for certain tumors. So the only problem with vascular endothelial growth factor is it's the best thing for your endothelial cell health. It makes them grow and healthy and happy and then whatever. And it makes them stimulates the, the, the creation of new endothelium cells in the, in the bone marrow. All right. So you can imagine if you knock that on the head, then it might have some problems with increasing the risk of heart disease. Well, and it does because um, it was nearly taken off the market. It was called um, Avastin, it's called vascular endothelial. And um, because after two years, it increased the risk of cardiovascular death by 2000%. Um, and had no impact on LDL or VLDL or HDL. So why did it cause heart disease? It caused heart disease because what I'm saying was damage to the endothelium, 
then there's a clip clot, then it's healed up, right? So what happens if you get rid of the clearing up system? Well, that clot, that area will, will not heal properly yeah. and it will continue to grow. So you need to keep, which is why Viagra has been found to reduce the risk of dying of heart disease quite considerably. Because what Viagra does is it stimulates nitric oxide and nitric oxide stimulates vascular endothelial growth factor and it keeps your blood vessels healthy. Right. So right. in a turn it around and say why, well, it's almost like I don't care about LDL, it doesn't cause heart disease. Let's look at something more interesting, which is what does cause heart disease and what can you do about it, all right? Yeah. And what can you do about it? Well, you don't smoke. Air pollution will do the same thing for you. Stress will do it for you. Diabetes will do it for you. There's various toxins in the in 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 the environment like lead and cadmium and various things that really damage your endothelium. Uh, bacteria you can't do much about, but they'll damage it. Viruses will damage it. High blood pressure will damage it. You know, just calm your endothelium down. All right. You know, um, um, periodontal disease will do it. So, so what's, what's good many... for nitric oxide? Sorry? If it, if what's good for nitric oxide? Um, sunlight, sunshine, sunlight. get out of the sun. Yeah. study in uh, Sweden showed that women who had the least sun exposure compared to the ones who had the most sun exposure, the effect on life expectancy was to reduce it by far eight years. And it was as bad for you as smoking was to avoid the sun. Wow. Wow. And exercise increases nitric oxide synthesis. The sun does. Yeah. Um, and uh, beetroot does. And things that have yeah. got nitrates in them. In fact, say, Viagra does. Yeah. And all these things do. All right. Was, so there are gonna, things. Yeah. There sorry. are things that can do it. All right. Yeah. Sorry, I was just going to cut in there um, because I, I'm from the fitness industry originally, and um, there are supplements out there that advertise nitric oxide production and so i made that connection that they because in when it yes. comes to vascular to blood vessels nitric yes. oxide makes them look big and yes. so that's good for let's say someone who wants to build muscle and wants to you know body yes. build um so well, l-arginine l is is a substance that you can take and l-arginine can be found you can get it as a supplement um it's used as a cofactor for the production of nitric oxide in mm. the endothelium and it does work for some people. I'm not sure if it works for super healthy people. I think it works for people who've got a problem, okay, yeah. if you like. I think if you, I wouldn't overdo it, put it yeah, that way. I see. Um, so, yeah, um, so what I was going to ask then, because um, I'm just thinking about just the practicalities of this. So if someone was to have steak, to have um, eggs and not have to count how many eggs they're having in a week, um to eat salt and um, animal foods and animal uh, proteins and um was to exercise lower their stress um are you saying that this person this kind of person wouldn't have an issue with um heart disease unless obviously they have um some sort of uh genetic predisposition, predisposition to like blood clotting um issues yeah, yeah. but um can we eat steak and eggs can we can, do yeah. all of that stuff and it has no, no link to heart disease whatsoever no yes no to okay whatsoever. right i'm gonna do some food shopping after this <laughs> no. stock up my trolley yeah, look, I mean, vegetables are unhealthy it's ridiculous to say that mm. but but you know uh, eggs are a superfood yes yeah. no doubt about it um and meat has got everything you need yeah. in it you don't need any carbohydrates in your diet whatsoever. You can yeah. live perfectly well without them. But um, you know, the, the you know there there are you know so you can it's a bit like this. You can move risk right around, and you can improve risk. But you'll never get rid of it. Mm -hmm. You know, you can still get struck by lightning. You can do all the right things. You get a bacterial infection. It releases exotoxins. Goes into your endothelium. Bang, you're dead. Mm -hmm. That can happen. All right. Yeah. And some people can smoke and smoke, and yet, you know, their repair systems are fantastic, so they don't run into problems. Yeah. So what you're, what you're doing is you're shifting risk. You know, I never say to someone, if you did A, B, C, D, and E, you'll never die of heart disease. That's yeah, nonsense. I get that. I say, if you do A, B, C, and D, you're much less likely to die of heart disease. Yeah. But I, I can't guarantee you won't. Yeah. You know, I don't know, perhaps you've been licking um, lead off, you know, lead pipes for all your life, and then you're going to die of heart disease. <laughs> uh, you know, or, or whatever. You know, and there are some genetic conditions that mean that you've know, got SLEs, nothing you can do about that. You've got huge disease, nothing you can do about that. You can get checked for these things. 
but and you can get treated for these things so you know diet if you are fit and healthy and you're not full of carbohydrates you can eat carbohydrates it's not a problem but a lot of people once they start eating too many carbohydrates and they can't store them and then their system goes haywire yeah you've got to cut them down all right so to, well, to kind of put it in like a definite kind of i'm trying to frame it nicely um so if someone is fit and healthy you know their stress levels are managed um and they kind of look after themselves in general what would you say is the ideal diet from a heart perspective well i would say um a bit like i'm going to quote zoe here is the ideal diet is stuff that doesn't contain a, lot, a huge long list of ingredients all right because these things have unknown effects on you stay away from stay away from um too much vegetable oil stuff vegetable oils can affect your whole endothelial function but essentially you can eat anything anything that's an animal anything that's a fish almost all vegetables just the carbohydrates like pasta bread rice blah 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 just run them like down anything with flour or anything processed just bring it down bring it down yeah mm. and you will know that it's doing it. and stay away from beer unfortunately oh dear. That's one thing i can't do um so <laughs> well, you're scottish right or whiskey oh, so okay. uh and, and um, be, sugar you know, obviously I'm, sugar I, I, don't, well, I doubt I need to sugar, ask you about that. Yeah. I mean, mm. it's, not, it's not like deadly poison, but mm. you've got to be careful that you just yeah. don't overload on these things. But if you are, head up to the gym, do some high intense exercise and burn it off. Yeah. Get it out, you know. Yeah. So um, I've run out of time. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was just going to say that's the that was my last question. That's why I wanted to round it off nicely. Um, uh, I know but, I've bombarded you with quite a lot of technical stuff, but if people feel they can disentangle and disinfect, but also i like to give the sense is it's quite complicated yeah to understand it all but the basic things are simple you know it's got nothing to do with ldl it's to do with blood clotting and that's it yeah. and uh, the blood clotting won't happen if you don't damage your endothelium so mm -hmm. you've got to protect your endothelium what protects your endothelium you know well i've got a list in my book of all things but you, you can end up with a million things and it just gets too unwieldy you know yeah it does, yeah. What are the key things? You know, sunshine. I'm not putting them in any order. Sunshine. Go out for a walk in the sunshine. Have friends. Relax. Don't get stressed. You know, eat. Don't eat too many carbohydrates because you're going to run into trouble with your metabolism. And avoid toxins and do not smoke. Yeah. Love that's it. not everything, but it's very nearly there. Unfortunately, I. I can offer nothing that makes me large sums of money because I haven't patented anything yet. Well, do you know what? That's that's just absolutely perfect for this conversation, though. I think you've just rounded it off really, really well. Um, so, I mean, obviously, people can find you pretty much anywhere. They can just type in your name and then everything comes up. But do you have any yeah. preferred places that people can come to you? Yeah. Well, I do a blog, Dr. Malcolm Kennedy. I haven't been doing it for a while. In part, I'm running into trouble with my legal case and what i can say about things at the moment mm. which i'm going to, just going to do a blog certainly but there's, a, there's you know there's, there's 75 chapters on heart disease and what causes it which in the end ended up in my book which is the, the clock yeah. thickens which is kind of the synthesis of 40 years of thinking about this stuff and bringing it all together mm. and hopefully people can find that useful some people have said there's just so much i said well yeah Sorry, there is quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you didn't think it was going to be simple, did you? Yeah. Um, well, in some ways it is simple, but... It, it's not easy. It fast, yeah. yeah. Okay, brilliant. Well, thank you so much. That was really, really fab. And um, thanks so much for all the information. I know that everyone's going to benefit from it massively. So I really appreciate it. Well, I think if people can just stop being frightened of their cholesterol level and saturated fats, that's we're halfway there. Mm -hmm. you know? Thank you so much, okay, welcome. Yeah. Bye.